Thank you, Pastor Eric. Thank you, Mariner's family. You guys have been unbelievably great in loving and caring for people, not only here, but people all the way to the ends of the earth. And we have been beneficiaries of that. And I want to say a big thank you for your partnership with us. We've just finished uh, 1 million hours of prayer during which every day we have been praying for you and for your great nation. And it is so exciting for us to hear the amazing things that God is doing through the Mariners family. And we are so excited about the Multiply campaign. And I encourage all of you to get connected and engage and partner in this great cause. Uh, it's not about equal giving, but it's about equal sacrifice. And as you partner together, I believe the best days of Mariners Church is in front of you. And we look forward to continuing this relationship with you. It's a privilege for me to jump in and join this uh, great series that you are doing from the cross. This is week three. And uh, this message is not an Indian message or an American message. Um, while we are looking for great you know, stages and spaces to speak and preach from, Jesus is choosing to speak to us from the cross. You know, while Jesus was doing the ministry, he gave lots of teaching from different spaces, mountains and boats, the homes, farms, synagogues. But here, he's choosing to speak to us through the cross. He was on the cross for about six hours and he gave just very short seven statements in six hours. And today's is the longest of those sayings. I just want you to visualize, just to imagine what it would have been like for him to articulate these things, being on the cross, held up by nails, even to articulate these words, just taking the breath to speak would have been agony to him. But from there, in Mark chapter, uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 34, Jesus says, it was three o'clock in the afternoon. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Throughout the life of Jesus and the ministry, he had many challenges, many struggles, but he never complained about anything. When he was you know, denied, betrayed, forsaken by his own disciples. He said nothing. But at this very hour, when he felt like his father has forsaken him, when the, the sin of the world was placed on him, it crushed his heart to know that the relationship with the father might be broken. He never questioned his father. He always obeyed him. But this very hour, the feeling of forsakenness broke his heart. And he cries out, my God, my God, why you forsaken me? This cry gives us five key things to learn from. And I want us to focus on that. Don't worry. I know you're on American clock, so we'll be very quick. But I want you to know when we get to heaven, it will be Indian clock because in India, we have all the time in the world. So that's why it's called eternity. The first thing we can learn from this is this cry, Jesus is declaring that he is the Messiah. He is fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. It was not a cry for pity. Even it wasn't a cry uh, seeking an answer, but a declaration. I am the Messiah that was predicted in the Old Testament, especially in the 22nd Psalm. In those days when they referred to the scriptures, there was no chapters and verses. And so they would recite the first part of it and then the last, and then the congregation would join in and, and, and they know exactly what has been talked about. And David wrote these Psalms over a thousand years ago where he had not experienced these things, but prophetically he's speaking about the Messiah that is coming. You know, so Jesus starts the 22nd Psalm by saying, my God, my God, why are you forsaken? And the end of it, which actually says that, you know, some translate that it is finished. And um, so all the audience knew that he's referring to 22nd Psalm and he's declaring, I am the one that is being prophesied in the 22nd Psalm. 
And uh, we, we just want to recap some of the, the scriptures from the 22nd Psalm where it actually is describing um, the, you know, what Jesus is going through at this very hour. It says that, you know, he was scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hold insults, seeking their, their, shaking their heads. Let the Lord rescue him. I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned into wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like sun bay clay and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and they throw a dice for my clothing. Jesus is not only really fulfilling this prophecy, but many scholars agree that he's prophesied over 300 prophecies. Imagine, look at the accuracy of the descriptions of what Jesus is going through being declared a thousand years ago by David. Some people have said this was actually written uh, after the crucifixion, but we know that historians have uh, shown that there is actually original manuscript of this text from the 22nd Psalm written hundreds of years before Jesus still in existence. And this is amazing about God's Word. God's Word tells us the future before it happens. The Bible is the only book in the whole world that has the audacity and the accuracy to do so. Then this cry, Jesus is declaring, I am the Messiah that was prophesied. Who do you think he was? Do you believe him? And it is my prayer that you will, in this season of Easter, that you will also declare that he is the Messiah and God's word is the true. And it is, it is something that we need to believe in. The second thing that I want us to focus on is that this cry is teaching us how we are to respond to suffering and abandonment. As humans, it's natural for us to feel the injustice and abandonment. And we can feel like, you know, why do I deserve this? You know, through this cry, Jesus is saying to us, it is okay for you to feel the way that you do. It is okay for you to express your feelings. You know, God is not offended by your honesty and sincerity. So go ahead and express your frustrations. But He does not want us to act on our feelings. Instead, he wants us to act on like he did. And so he sets the perfect example for us in this story. We read Jesus, instead of cursing God, he calls on him. He says, my God, my God. He's setting a compelling example for us not to run from God, but to run to God. It's easy said than done. My dad had mental illness. And my grandparents were great godly people. They prayed. We used to fast and pray. We did everything that we could to see a healing or a deliverance for my father, but it never happened. And the lack of answers made me run away from God, doubt the existence of God. Little did I know that God had a different plan. You know, it is, if God is not delivering you and me from a situation, we need to know that God has got a better, greater plan that's different to our plan. We just got to keep trusting Him. But today, God is using us to start a ministry among mentally ill people where literally hundreds of thousands of mentally abused, neglected, homeless people have been loved and cared for because of my experience with my father. You know, God answers 100% of our prayers, but sometimes God answers our prayers the way we want. Other times, He answers the prayers the way He wants. So the question is, how do you respond when God answers your prayer the way He wants and not the way you want? You know, in this uh, cry, Jesus is not just calling God, but he says, my God. 
And this is a great example for us, you know, in, even in suffering, in, in feeling of abandonment, that, you know, we need to get closer to God, my God, the intimacy, not just your parents' God, your grandparents' God, but my God. Where, when you go through sufferings, Jesus is encouraging you to and me to draw closer to Him and have that intimacy and call Him my God. You know, it, it, it's not only really just my God once, but He calls twice. My God, my God. When pain and agony and suffering comes to us, he is telling us that we not only just need to grip on God with one hand, but the double grip, the double cry for help, the double grip, the double confession. My God, my God. You know, my wife um, and Jenny and I was on a plane and uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the engines failed and the, and the aircraft actually literally dropped and we had no idea what was going on. And she was sitting next to me in a flash. She just grabbed hold of me and I felt like my bones was crashing. I was already in the shock of the plane dropping and then she grabbing hold of me. And, and you know, God wants us to grab hold of Him in the moments of sufferings and pain, abandonment, loneliness, any time that we go through. That's why he is actually setting this example for us. He's not cursing God, he's, but he's crying to God. He's not running away from God, but he's running to God. You know, I love this uh, scripture from Job 13, 15. Job says, even if he kills me, I will trust in my God. In Romans chapter 8, 35, Paul tells me, what will separate me from the love of God? What has the suffering done to your faith? What has the COVID done to your relationship with Jesus? Has it got you closer to God? Has it got you your double confessing on Him as your God, as your Father? Has it got developed your intimacy closer with Him or has it drawn you away from Him? Today, from the cross, Jesus is inviting you to get closer to Him and to, and to confess Him as my God, my God. He's right there. The third thing that we can learn from this is in this cry, Jesus is exposing the ugliness and the consequence of sin. Today, many are trying to dilute and make sin into fun, you know, your Hollywood, the comedians, movies, advertisements, all trying to encourage us to indulge in sin, saying it's great fun. And some, some of us sometimes, you know, get confused with the free salvation being cheap salvation, thinking sin doesn't have that great consequence, not too bad. But I want to encourage you, don't confuse the free salvation to cheap salvation. Imagine somebody gives you a Rolex or a Ferrari or a mansion as a free gift to you. But does that mean it's cheap? No. Jesus paid a high price. He bought us with a high price. You know, he did not go hunting and looking for a cheap um, special uh, auction promotion or something like that. No, he paid the highest price for our sin, because sin is not fun. In fact, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 tells us, wages of sin is death. While the world is inviting us to indulge and enjoy in sin, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabatani is warning us to flee from it. It's, it is warning us that sin is ugly. It's seri it has serious consequences. Don't play around with it. Bible continued to tell us to flee from sin. Fleeing is not like just going for a little stroll or a little walk. It's like running away from wildfire or tsunami. Acceleration away from those things. You know, when Jesus was born at night, the star comes and there was light. But here at the cross, as the sins of the world was poured into him, in the middle of the day, there is darkness. That tells us sin is dark, it's real, it's ugly, it's evil. Don't let anybody fool you thinking otherwise. If sin is not real, we don't need the cross. If sin had no consequences, 
Jesus did not have to cry and go through the pain like he does here. I believe in grace, but grace does not give us the license and the permission to continue to live in sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 2, it says, Are we to remain in sin so that grace may increase? Absolutely no. Sin changes the status and the nature of our relationship with God. You know, Adam and Eve had the great privilege of walking and talking with God, having such personal intimacy with Him. But then sin caused the separation of the, that relationship that God had to call out and say, Adam, where are you? I lost you. I lost the relationship with you. Just as Adam changed the status of our relationship with God. Right here on the cross, Jesus is changing the nature of our relationship, the status of our relationship with God. As our sin was laid on Him, His relationship with the Father changes from Father to God. He doesn't call my Father, my Father. He says, my God, my God. This is the first time He's addressing God as, uh, uh, his father as God. You know, in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, it says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. His relationship changed from father to God so that our relationship can be changed from God to father. When He was teaching us to pray. He doesn't say, you know, our God in heaven. He says, but our Father. We are able to do that because of what Jesus is doing in this moment on the cross. If you're struggling with any kind of sin, I want you to know this, that God still loves you and He still wants to be your Father. Second, you are not alone. We all have various challenges The third is there is no condemnation or guilt. There is grace and forgiveness abundantly available through Jesus Christ. For this barrenness as a church is here to help you. Reach out, call, text, contact and say, hey, would you help me? The church is here to help you break free and flee from the sins because it is ugly, it's serious. In this cry, we are also seeing that Jesus is actually saying to us, I'm atoning for your sins. Our sins have been atoned. And atonement is a big theological word. Um, But at this very moment, that's what is taking place. Atonement means a non-related party is paying to correct the wrongs of the guilty party. Jesus is paying for our sins in this very moment. He allows our sins to be poured on Him so that His goodness can be poured into us. It is amazing what is taking place in this very moment, in this very hour of the Scriptures. And we need to, you know, just look at the Scriptures. The Scriptures explains this so beautifully. In 1 chapter 2 verse 2, He says that He is atoning He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, He made him who knew no sin to be the sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. I love this in Isaiah chapter 53, 4 to 6. It says, surely He took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we consider Him to be punished by God. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that was brought us peace was on Him. And by His wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to turn our own way as the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 to 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace 
in which we stand. Yes, Jesus took care of our sins. He did not just cancel our sin. He paid for our sin. And that's the incredible love. You know, his love was not just empty words. I love you. And, and he was not afraid of the consequences of de- taking our sins. You know, when I was about 13 years of age in school, I loved, well, I liked, you know, it was a bit of an inf- infatuation. I liked this girl. She was pretty and really nice girl. Only one issue in our cultural context, she was from a lower, low caste. Somehow my grandfather came to know about this, you know, uh, my interest in this girl. And uh, she, he, one day he called me into his room and uh, I, did, I knew I was in some sort of trouble the way he was calling and talking to me. And then he said, hey, I heard that you like this girl. And I knew the consequences uh, if, I, if I exactly declared my love or interest in this girl, I knew I was in trouble and there would have been major consequences. So the fear of consequences made me deny and back out of everything. But you know what? Jesus doesn't do that. The fear of consequences of the cross does not uh, compel Jesus to back out. Rather, it pushes him forward and he declares on the cross, I love you this much. You know, don't let the devil ever lie to you or cause you to doubt or question his love for you. Recently, I met a young lady uh, who has abandoned Jesus and left the church. And because when I asked her the reason and she said, well, I don't feel that God loves me. You know, cross tells us Jesus loves you. You know, if, if he did not love, he didn't have to go through this terrible agonies and the pain. And he demonstrated his love for us through this uh, very cry that he is crying to us. And, you know, when at the same time, I want us to remember there are millions and millions of people who have never heard that Jesus loves them. They have never heard about the atonement of Jesus. They have never heard, you know, the cry, my God, my God, why you have forsaken me. They are still searching and it is God's desire that none should perish, but all must come to know that He's atoned for them. So they don't need to atone for their pain, their, their sins and, and uh, sacrifice. There are people doing unbelievable things to atone for their own sins. Friends, we have a responsibility to let them know how much God loves them. And uh, not only, not, you know, it's not our job to, to force them to become Christians, but it's our job to offer, to accept or reject is theirs, but to offer is ours. That's why Mariners is so crazy about the Great Commission, reaching people from here all the way to the ends of the earth. Now, uh, imagine if Pastor Eric and Kay, you know, very loving people because they are very hospitable, take me out for a meal. And because they are very generous, they pay for the meal. Now I have two options. I can fight with with them and say, no, I don't want you to pay. I want to pay my own. Uh, That's the pride in me that would cause me to do that. Or I can accept and receive that and say, hey, thank you so much. But, But it takes humility. It's the same thing with God. For many of us, our pride is stopping us from accepting God's free gift of salvation, His free gift of grace. But it takes humility to say, God, I receive your gift, gift of salvation, gift of grace. And I'm praying that today as we listen to God's word, that the pride will not stop you from receiving God's love and grace, that you would receive with humility. Because he paid the price, because he cried out, my God, my God, why you have forsaken me? We never have to do that. We are never forsaken. In fact, He promises us that heaven, heaven and earth will pass away, but He will never, never, ever leave us. He will always be with us. Your father and mother may forsake you, but He will never forsake you. Even till the very end, He'll be with us. What a reassuring words and promises that we have from Jesus. You know, this cry is the, you know, is the fifth one I want to point out is this cry is not a cry for pity or even an answer, but this cry is a cry 
of victory. It's a cry of declara- declaring. The second part of uh, the 22nd Psalm tells us, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't talk about being forsaken, but it talks about proclamation, praise and joy of nations coming to Him. Let me summarize the second part of the 22nd Psalm. It says, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. Praise the Lord. All you fear Him, honor Him. All you descendants of Jacob, show Him reverence. All you descendants of Israel, for He has not ignored the suffering of the needy. He has not turned His back on them, but has listened to their cry for help. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise Him. Their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. I love this. this, The whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to Him. All the families of the nations will bow down before Him. For royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all the nations. Let the rich of the earth feast and worship. Bow before Him, all who are mortal. Our children will serve Him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything He has done. This doesn't end with the cry. Rather, it ends with proclamation, praise, and the joy of nations coming together. Friends, because of what Jesus did on the cross, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 to 10 is possible. It says that after this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out, not saying, my God, my God, why you forsaken me? But they cried out saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. Friends, just because Jesus cried this cry, we and nations can shout and say, salvation belongs to our God. 2000 years ago, Jesus filled the part, first part of the 22nd Psalm. But the second part of the 22nd Psalm is being fulfilled as we engage in the Great Commission. This this is a great challenge for us. Jesus fulfilled the first part and He has left the second part for us and our obedience. He obeyed the Father to see the first part to be fulfilled. And He is expecting and waiting for us to fulfill the second part. He's expecting for us to obey Him so that from home, to the ends of the earth, people will have the opportunity to hear this great message of Jesus. That's why I'm so excited about your Multiply campaign. And it is so strategic and important. And and I pray that you will engage and partner in this. Also, I want to encourage you, as you as you embrace this great forgiveness and mercy of Jesus, know that we have a responsibility to tell others Why don't you tell the person sitting next to you that Jesus loves you? Now, why don't you tell them like you really, really, really mean it, that Jesus loves you? Why don't you tell your family, your friends, your neighbors? Why don't you post on your social media feeds? Why don't you tell the world that Jesus loves them? He paid for their sins. He's atoned for their sins. He's inviting you and me to take this good news to the ends of the earth. I want to encourage you to to bring your friends next week to church. Pastor Eric will be teaching um, next week on the amazing, beautiful words. Another one of the message from the cross is, today you will be in paradise with me. There will be great opportunity for people to do that. So bring your non-believing friends along. As we close, I want to encourage you. Let us affirm and proclaim that Jesus is my Messiah, our Messiah. Let's proclaim that Bible is God's Word and we believe it to be God's Word. Let's also 
take hold of the example that Jesus set for us. Let us follow him, not, not by cursing God, but by crying to God, not by running away from God, but by running to God and not, not drawing our souls, withdrawing our souls from God, but developing a personal intimacy with God, even in our suffering and pain. Let's not weaken our grip on God, but let's add our double grip and say, my God, my God, I need you. Let's be fully aware about the ugliness and the seriousness of sin and let's flee from it. Let's accept and receive the atonement of Jesus with a grateful heart, with thankful heart and allow our sins to be poured on Him and receive His goodness into us. Let us resolve never to doubt His love for us. Let's respond with a grateful gratitude heart. Just as Jesus obeyed the Father, let's obey His mission. Let's give everyone an opportunity to hear this great news, good news from our neighbors to the ends of the earth. Let's pray for the lost. Let's connect and engage with them. Let's invite them to join to, with you in the church. Participate and partner in the Multiply campaign and engage in serving and giving. Pray. Give, go, do all that you can. If you will, in eternity, you will be so glad you did that.